Hello and welcome to this program. I'm Dr. Stephen Nathan. I'm the Medical Director of the Advanced Lung Disease and Lung Transplant Program at Anova Fairfax Hospital. And I'm joined today by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Jonathan Chung. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Yeah, I'm Section Chief of Cardiopulmonary Imaging at the University of Chicago. And it's uh, quite a pleasure to be here. Likewise, thank you. So for today's agenda, we're gonna have uh, three tasks. We're gonna, the first, uh, Masterclass is understanding the pathophysiology and prevalence of interstitial lung diseases. The second one is interpreting HRCT accurately in terms of a differential diagnosis of the various ILDs. And the third task for us this evening is the importance of multidisciplinary discussion in reaching an accurate diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So I'm going to start us off first up to bat is understanding the pathophysiology and prevalence of interstitial lung diseases. So what is interstitial lung disease? This is a, a, a fairly uh, simple cartoon depiction of the interstitium in the lung and the interface between uh, that and the uh, alveolar capillary membrane. But what interstitial lung disease refers to is uh, involvement of the interstitium of the lung generally on a diffuse basis with elements of inflammation and or fibrosis. And there are many things that can cause this. There are over 150 plus different causes of interstitial lung disease. And our task this evening is to walk you through how to make as accurate diagnosis as possible. So why are interstitial lung diseases difficult to diagnose? Firstly, I mentioned that there are many disorders. The symptoms that they typically present with are shortness of breath plus minus cough. And if you think about the ILDs in general, they're relatively rare. Um, if IPF, for example, a prototypical illness, it's estimated that there are 150 to 175,000 cases in the US. If you think that IPF is about one third of all ILDs, then that's about a half a million cases of ILD in the US. Compare that then to competing diseases. When I say competing, I mean in terms of symptoms. COPD, for example, presents with shortness of breath and cough. And we're talking about 14 million in the US. Asthma, another 20 million chronic congestive heart failure, another 5 million. So it's not all that surprising that a lot of times interstitial lung disease goes undiagnosed and some of these other conditions are diagnosed erroneously at first. What should trigger an evaluation for interstitial lung disease? So exertional dyspnea, non-productive cough, those are certainly common symptoms, but always on the differential should be interstitial lung disease. The next uh, step in terms of a uh, diagnostic algorithm is generally some form of chest imaging, usually a chest X-ray, maybe some people go straight to a CT and you'll, you'll see something abnormal on the, on the chest uh, imaging, which uh, Jonathan will go through in more details. A very important clue comes on physical exam. Many of these patients will have crackles at the bases specifically, especially with the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. If it's IPF, these crackles are uh, described as Velcro-like in nature. It sounds like Velcro getting pulled apart. Once you hear these crackles, they're very distinctive. You won't forget them. But that's a, an important clue. That tells you that there's some kind of interstitial lung disease and that it's not obstructive lung disease. The crackles are coarse versus the fine crackles of heart failure. Uh, patients tend to be short of breath, so it's not uncommon for them to desaturate with activity. And typically in our practice, we always get a six minute walk test in these patients to evaluate for that. And then their PFTs are generally, but not always accompanied by a low FVC. You can see a low FVC with uh, obstructive lung disease like COPD as well. But the key element in restrictive lung disease is that the FVC and FEV1 are both reduced proportionately to one another so that the FEV1 to FVC ratio is actually normal or increased versus obstructive lung disease where the FEV1 to FEC ratio is reduced. You can have significant interstitial lung disease with normal spirometry. That's an important point. Normal spirometry doesn't rule out interstitial lung disease. This is a, um, I, I, I can actually kick this over to Jonathan to comment, but um, this to me, I don't want to preempt Jonathan, but would you agree that this is a typical UIP pattern? Looks pretty classic for UIP. We got the peripheral predominant pulmonary fibrosis with obvious areas of subfloral honeycombing. You don't need me to diagnose that, I know. Uh, it's good to have your validation though. That's what I thought, thank you very much. So um, actually this one I'll get you to comment on uh, as well. Uh, you can comment on the top. I will make believe that I'm a pathologist and I'll comment on the bottom. 
Well, so the CT images look like they're sequential in the, in the same patient, Sli slightly different planes, but very similar. And you see the difference between what a normal looks like on the left. And then over time, we see increasing degrees of pulmonary fibrosis, which is really characterized by increasing degree of reticulation. So those tiny little uh, lattice-like net-like opacities, as well as more architectural distortion and, and subpleural cystic abnormality, which represents honeycombing and some areas of traction bronchiex as well. So um, essentially, you know, it's, it's, if you wanted to dumb it down, it's the coarseness. So increasing opacities, which are coarse with superimposed cystic areas, those are areas of fibrosis. Thank you. And uh, looking at the bottom, um, what we uh, typically see or describe with, pat with pathologic UIP, which is the pathologic correlate of IPF, is a pattern of heterogeneity. You see different things in different parts of the lung. So if you look on the left-hand side, you see some relatively well-preserved areas of lung. Uh, I have to get very close to see that. Uh, but to the far right, you see, see areas of microscopic honeycombing. So you need to see different things happening throughout the lungs. Uh, normal lung, areas of fresh collagen deposition. Under higher power, you can see these fibroblastic foci. And when you have advanced or end-stage lung disease, you see the honeycomb that, uh, that is shown, uh, depicted on the right. If you just see that right panel, that's end-stage lung, and it's not enough to make a diagnosis of IPF. So that's an important point when we, when we talk to our thoracic surgeon, don't go to the area of most diseased lung. We know what you're gonna show there. You're gonna so, show end-stage microscopic honeycombing. We need areas of relatively normal looking lung. And what's always an interesting surprise to me, and a number of pathologists have commented on this, is that the surgeon can go off to relatively normal areas of lung, and you can see very evident histopathologic UIP, where the pathology looks worse than what the HRCT does. The five-year survival of IPF is worse than most cancers. I think this is something that's relatively underappreciated. Um, if you look at uh, the data here, about a 25-30% five-year survival. The only two cancers that are worse than this are actually lung cancer itself and pancreatic cancer. The, if you look at the literature, at least historically, prior to the antifibrotic era, the median survival of patients with IPF was anywhere from around two and a half to five years. Um, with antifibrotics, there's more and more emerging data from multiple registries to suggest that uh, the use of antifibrotic therapy is associated with, long, with increased survival. IPF becomes increasingly likely as the age of the patient increases. And this is one paper that, or actually two papers that uh, um, attest to this. And so the older the patient is, especially north of 70, the greater the likelihood is that they have IPF. From this one particular paper that came up with a UIP score model, based on age, male sex, and certain changes on the HRCT for a total possible score of 10. And this performed relatively well in terms of predicting pathologic UIP. But age, once again, amongst all the clinical parameters is a very big predictor in any patient with ILD that it's gonna turn out to be IPF. This is a diagnostic algorithm. Uh, it's been shown in many places from the uh, guidelines in terms of how do you, how do you approach someone who has ILD, where you're concerned about IPF in particular. So history and physical, very important, especially history to rule out any kind of exposures. Sometimes you have to rule, uh, you have to dig quite deep to elicit a history of exposures, occupational history, family history, very important. A lot of times you can get important clues from just taking a history. Um, the HRCT that Jonathan's gonna talk about is really the central diagnostic tool that's gonna direct you one way or the other. And Jonathan will get into the various patterns that, that are seen on the HRCT. In some cases, when there's uncertainty, one needs to go into a surgical lung biopsy. Uh, multidisciplinary discussions are important, sometimes before, but even, uh, but even more important after the surgical lung biopsy, because this enables a more accurate diagnosis when you have all the key players and disciplines in the same room. So pulmonology, uh, sometimes rheumatology, thoracic radiology, and pathology sitting around a table, sometimes disagreeing, but then coming to a consensus diagnosis. Attempt to elicit an exposure that might cause ILD. We have some little chickens on the, on the left um, that goes to bird fanciers disease or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Drugs on the right and there are various drugs that can cause or be associated with interstitial lung disease. And then mold exposure as well can lead to chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis.
So in terms of making the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic, everything else has been ruled out. So no alternate cause of the ILD, and we've mentioned that. Uh, UIP pattern on HRCT in the right clinical context is sometimes enough to make the diagnosis. Um, and we can talk about in more detail about what a probable UIP pattern is and sometimes even an indeterminate UIP pattern. In my practice, if you have a probable UIP pattern, but you are an elderly male, former smoker, nothing else going on, then that might be enough to make a diagnosis of IPF. Sometimes even in the context of an indeterminate scan, if the pretest likelihood based on the clinical is great enough, that can also sometimes be enough to make a diagnosis of IPF. On occasion, a surgical lung biopsy is needed. In our practice, maybe about 10 or 15% of patients will come to a surgical lung biopsy to attain a diagnosis. The differential, as I alluded to, includes collagen vascular diseases, um, specifically scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, and Sjogren's being the most common, but then also mixed connective tissue disease. For any patient presenting, I will at least get a, a basic rheumatologic panel, an ANA, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP. If they're younger or have elements that might be suggestive of an underlying connective tissue disease, then I'll get a, a more extensive panel to rule out an underlying CTD. A lot of times the CTD might only become apparent over time. Frequent, not infrequently, patients present with the interstitial lung disease first as the first manifestation of the underlying CTD, which only manifests months to years later on. So when I counsel patients, I tell them that. I say, well, your diagnosis today is IPF, but this could evolve over time. Interstitial lung disease in systemic sclerosis, uh, very common, something that we screen for all the time. Uh, in autopsy series, most patients will have some kind of element of interstitial lung disease. There are ways of categorizing it in terms of limited versus extensive, asymptomatic versus symptomatic, non-progressives versus progressives. And the, the schema on the right shows you one way of evaluating extensive versus more limited disease based on the HRCT as well as lung function studies. Um, this is the colorful slide, somewhat busy once again, which gets into uh, a little bit more of the weeds with these various disorders. NSIP, uh, 14 to 36% of chronic fibrosing uh, cases of, of idiopathic interstitial uh, pneumonia. All the CTDs that we mentioned already, unclassifiable in various series between 10 and 20% of ILD cases are unclassifiable. And then chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We have sometimes the biggest problem differentiating chronic HP from IPF. In terms of chronic HP, it's very important once again on the history. The history a lot of times will give you an idea or a clue that patients might have chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then Jonathan, I'm sure, is going to talk about some of the HRCT features that are characteristic of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Importance of early diagnosis and intervention. And the point is made here that irreversible lung damage caused by disease progression underscores the importance of early treatment to improve prognosis. As we talk about the antifibrotic therapies, they do not cure the disease, they do not reverse the damage, they slow the rate of progression of disease, they slow down the progressive fibrosis. So the sooner one can uh, make a diagnosis, the earlier one can make a diagnosis, the earlier one can start preserving patient's lung function. The two approved antifibrotics are nintenanib on the left and profenadone on the right. Uh, they were actually both approved on the same day by the FDA in October 2014. So we've had them around in the US for about six years now. Since then, nintenanib has also been studied in uh, scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease. That was the sensor study shown to work there. And towards the end of 2019, there was an an additional indication for the use of nintenanib in patients with SSC ILD. Similarly, the inbuilt study was a study of nintenanib in a progressive fibrotic phenotype. What do we mean by progressive fibrotic phenotype? Well, those are patients who have some form of fibrosis and there is some evidence of progression of disease. The inbuilt study was positive and now nintenanib is improved for this progressive fibrotic phenotype. Profenadone, on the other hand, has been approved for IPF based on three studies, two capacity studies and the ASCEND study. It has been studied in scleroderma as well as other forms of pulmonary fibrosis, including rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there was a study of profenadone in unclassifiable interstitial lung disease. 
Um, the primary endpoint was home-based spirometry. Uh, it was a negative study based on that. However, if the study primary endpoint was a tried and tested clinical FEC obtained in the clinical centers, then it would have been a positive study. So no, more to follow around that. This is data from the combined Tomorrow and Impulsa studies. There was the phase two Tomorrow study led, uh, followed by the two uh, phase three studies, Impulsus one and Impulsus two. And if you combine the data, there's a very clear signal that nitenanib slows the rate of loss of lung function compared to placebo. What's interesting is you can see the curves come apart pretty, pretty early on at 12 weeks. And this attests to the early initiation of therapy so you can pres start preserving lung function as soon as possible. Similar data for clofenadone. This is the ASCEND and two capacity studies showing the difference coming, uh, uh, coming apart early once again and staying apart at 12 weeks. Um, so it's great from our standpoint, from the patient standpoint that we have two drugs that we are able to offer these patients. Uh, this looks like somewhat of a busy slide, but this is the data from census uh, showing that the patients who got nitenanib uh, compared to placebo had a slower rate of loss of lung function. If you look at the, on the left-hand side at this histogram, you can see that the placebo arm in the scleroderma study didn't deteriorate as fast as the IPF patients from the prior impulsor studies, but there was still a difference between those who got uh, nitenanib versus those who got placebo, and this was statistically significant. Um, some people have argued, well, what is the difference? 40 cc's um, at 52 weeks versus what we saw in IPF, over 100 cc's, but this adds up over time, and one has to bear in mind that patients with scleroderma are, lung are younger and hopefully have many more years to live. So once again, my personal bias is to start the therapy or offer the therapy at least as early as possible, even in patients who have scleroderma who have evidence of uh, fibrosis. Annual rate of decline in FEC over 52 weeks by HRCT pattern in the inbuilt study. Inbuilt was the study in this progressive fibrotic phenotype included patients with chronic HP, NSI, NSIP, unclassifiable, also included patients with connective tissue disease. And there were uh, two primary endpoints that were uh, pre-specified in the study. For the, for the overall population, you can see it was positive here. And then just for those patients who had a UIP-like fibrotic pattern, and um, it looked like it performed maybe a little bit better, but the confidence intervals overlapped, uh, it was still good and it was still of benefit in patients who didn't, who had a non-URP pattern though as well. So great, we've come to the end of that particular section and I see that there are some questions from the audience. The first one is, what is the pathophysiology of interstitial lung disease? Well, gosh, that's a very broad question being that there are about 150 different causes of interstitial lung disease and um, you know, you have to think about the 150 different causes. I'll give you um, maybe a mnemonic that will help uh, as we think about the pathophysiology because there are various elements of inflammation as well as elements of fibrosis that can uh, accompany any of these forms of interstitial lung disease. But the mnemonic that I've learned as a fellow and I'll share with you is uh, five I's and an N. And uh, what, are those, what do they stand for? The first I is infection. You can get various infections causing interstitial lung disease, uh, CMV pneumonia, influenza pneumonia, uh, gosh, even COVID can give you interstitial lung disease. We're seeing that emerging more and more. Actually, an interesting point around that is as patients recover or try to recover from COVID, we are seeing some CAT scans that have significant fibrosis. So this could well be an emerging cause of interstitial lung disease. So infection, uh, immunologic, which would be the underlying connective tissue diseases. We think inflammation is important there, but then fibrosis kicks in as well. Iatrogenic, what we do to patients with antibiotics, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, that's another cause of interstitial lung disease. Um, inhalational, asbestosis, silicosis, even chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you can put under, in, in, under inhalational. And then we have the idiopathics uh, where we don't know, like IPF. IPF being the prototypical idiopathic, we think it's a disease of fibroblastic proliferation. The fibroblast switches on and fails to switch off what causes this malfunction in the signaling process remains uncertain at this time. Uh, but there's certain uh, things that are associated with IPF. For example, anyone working in any kind of um, environmental exposure, such as woodworking, metalworking, hairdressers, dentists, 
anything that you breathe in increases the likelihood of patients developing IPF. The next question is, is IPF synonymous with UIP? And the answer to that very simply is no. Typically what we see with IPF is this UIP pattern, either radiographically or histopathologically, but you can see the same pattern radiographically or histopathologically with other entities such as College of Vascular Diseases or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even asbestosis and other, disease, and other diseases as well can give you a UIP pattern. The next question is, what is the role of open lung biopsy and cryobiopsy in patients with HRCT not characteristic of IPF? Well, when we talk about an open lung biopsy, now generally we talk about a video assisted thor thoracoscopic approach. So not truly the old way we used to do it in terms of an open lung biopsy. I think when there is diagnostic uncertainty and where making a specific diagnosis is important and will change the management of the patient, then that is time to consider obtaining tissue. Different programs, different providers uh, will prefer one over the other. At our particular program, we have an outstanding thoracic surgeon who does same day VATS. 90% uh, of the patients go home the same day. So we are very comfortable getting a VATS biopsy and generally we don't go for cryos. I think this, the role of cryos is still somewhat controversial. Um, it's not a benign procedure, can result in bleeding. And you don't get the subpleural areas like you want to in terms of making an accurate diagnosis of IPF. So my bias is to get a VATS, and this probably happens in about 10 or 15% of our cases uh, of ILD where we have diagnostic uncertainty. So it gives me great pleasure to move on to our next segment and introduce my, my co-presenter and co-host, uh, Jonathan Chung, who's gonna talk about interpreting HRCTs accurately in, in the differential diagnosis of the ILDs. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction and thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, so we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. So before we start talking about what the UIP pattern is on CT, which again is the imaging and histological correlate of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as the other fibrotic patterns that we see on HRCT, we have to know what an HRCT really is and what differentiates an HRCT from your regular standard chest CT. And so there's a lot of data on these next few slides describing really what the HRCT is, but really I could dumb it down to these four things and really summarize. So the first most important part of what an HRCT is compared to a regular chest CT is the reconstruction. So it must be very thin or acquired very thin. So most people would agree less than two millimeters. At University of Chicago, we do one millimeter. Some people at other centers do even thinner than that. And so why do we get so thin? It's because if you have a thick reconstruction, then these very fine findings of pulmonary fibrosis, especially the early findings of pulmonary fibrosis, which are reticulation, these little lattice-like opacities, they volume average with normal lung, and then you get this smudgy ground glass opacity rather than the, the actual fibrotic changes that we see on CT. And so someone might be misled by that pattern. So thin reconstruction. Second thing is we don't give intravenous contrast in these patients. Someone asked me, if you did give intravenous contrast in these patients on HRCT, would it limit your evaluation for interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis? And I'll tell you, in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't. It, you would get the same answer. But because there is risk with giving intravenous contrast, we don't give it. Now, obviously, as doctors, the, the first step in any patient evaluation and patient treatment is to do no harm. So if you don't need it, don't give it. So in addition to doing our regular supine imaging, in full inspiration, we also do two extra series. And these are the next two things, which really differentiates an HRCT from a regular chest CT. And the first thing is that we do supine um, expiratory imaging, or some people actually do prone expiratory imaging. And so the only reason we do expiratory imaging in these patients is really to look for one thing, to look for severe air traffic, because that draws you away from a diagnosis of UIP and more toward diagnosis of an alternative diagnosis, something like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or perhaps um, obliterative bronchiolitis in someone with underlying connective tissue disease. So that's number three. And then the last thing that differentiates an HRCT from a regular standard chest CT is that we also do prone imaging. And so the prone imaging of these four things is probably the least important of these, of the, of these four things that differentiates an HRCT from regular chest CT, but it's still important. I'd say maybe one out of 20 cases does it help me, 
Uh, so, you know, 5% of cases, but still a, a high quality HRCT, you still want to do those prone uh, cases or at least screen, screen patients who might require prone imaging. And the only reason we do these prone images is that um, when patients are lying on their back, there is weight to the lungs. Mostly they're gas filled, but obviously there's blood in there, connective tissue, whatnot. And so in the posterior aspect of lungs, when the patient's lying on the back, there's going to be a little bit of atelectasis and that can obscure very early pulmonary fibrosis. And so what do we do? We flip the patient over onto their belly so that we can get a better look at the posterior aspect of lungs, opening up those areas of atelectasis. And really those four things are the things that differentiates an HRCT from a regular chest CT. Okay, so now that we know what a HRCT is, let's talk about the imaging patterns. And so in 2018, the multi-society ATS guidelines were released that discussed UIP CT classification. And so there are four classifications here, four, four sub-tiers in this classification uh, schema. And so it's UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate for UIP, and alternative diagnosis. And so of these, probably as a radiologist, where I'm actually most helpful to the clinician is when I can say that an HRCT pattern is UIP. So if I, if I look at the HRCT pattern as shown here in this patient with peripheral pulmonary fibrosis characterized mostly by subpleural honeycombing, uh, this is pretty classic for UIP. If I say this is UIP, I will you know, take it to the bank. I will eat my hat if it's not UIP. Over 90% of the time, a lot of studies actually say over 95% of the time, it will be UIP in pathology. So in these situations, we've obviated pathology. We do not take these patients for pathology anymore uh, for pathological specimens because we don't need to. The accuracy is that good. So what is UIP on HRC? So what is this pattern? You need to have peripheral and basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis with subpleural honeycomb. And again, this is very important, no other findings that suggest an alternative diagnosis. And I'll discuss in just a little bit what these other findings that suggest alternative diagnosis are. The next category in the ATS guidelines is probable UIP. And the beauty of the probable UIP pattern is that if you know what UIP is, you know what probable UIP is. It's more or less exactly the same. I'm taking a little, maybe a little bit of liberties here, a little bit of liberty here, but more or less exactly the same as UIP, except there's no subpleural honeycomb. So you're still looking for peripheral and basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis uh, with traction, bronchiexis and bronchiolexis very often present, uh, but no subpleural honeycombing. And again, this, this last part is important. No other findings that suggest an alternative diagnosis. Indeterminate for UIP uh, is actually one of my favorite categories. Uh, in the previous guidelines, previous version of these guidelines, there was no room for indeterminate UIP. So you essentially what this classification system is, uh, are this is a classification for hard cases. Um, imaging patterns where it's difficult to put into one of the other three categories. And now that we have this, when we do come across these difficult, hard to diagnose cases, we have a place to put them into rather than trying to pigeonhole them into categories that where they don't actually uh, belong. So uh, this is actually new for, for this version of the multi-sided guidelines. And I'm very happy that it's here. But so some examples are um, in patients with pulmonary fibrosis that it's very mild. Right, so so mild that you can't really put your finger on exactly what pattern it is. Or perhaps there's some findings that are suggestive alternative diagnosis, but they're not florid. They're just kind of these mild sort of abnormalities. For example, in this case, we see a little bit of ground glass opacity within the lungs with a little bit of superimposed mosaic attenuation. These are actually findings of alternative diagnosis, but they're not that severe. They don't seem to be the major finding on this CT. And so when you have these sort of hard cases, and again, instead of trying to put them into a category where they don't truly belong, and you don't have high confidence, we now have a place for them. And then the last diagnostic category in the ATS multi-society guidelines is alternative diagnosis. And really this is alternative diagnosis to IPF, to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And so these are any findings which really don't, um, they're discordant with UIP. They don't jive with UIP more or less. And so these are things in which the distribution is not right. Instead of being peripheral and basal predominant, perhaps they're upper or central lung preponderant. Uh, you perhaps have a lot of mosaic attenuation or air trapping, which again, really doesn't go with UIP. It doesn't suggest a UIP pattern. It's much more suggestive as hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or again, sometimes patients with connective tissue disease as well. Or perhaps there's these findings of uh, diffuse pulmonary opacity, like consolidation, 
or a lot of diffuse nodular lung disease or ground glass opacity. These are certainly findings which are not typically seen in patients with UIP, and that would draw us away from UIP and toward this alternative diagnostic category. I'm really, this alternative diagnostic category is very heterogeneous. It's a hodgepodge of things that don't feel like UIP. In this example, we have inspiratory image here uh, uh, more superiorly, and then more inferiorly, we have this expiratory image. And the same patient had a similar slice. And so on the inspiratory image, we have these areas of mosaic attenuation, so these, these these areas of lower density with some polygons of low density in the right lung. And on expiration, we see that these areas of mosaic attenuation, uh, they actually represent air trapping. How do we know they're air trapping? It's because they stay equally as black on inspiration and on expiration. So we know this severe air trapping, certainly not consistent with UIP. It just doesn't feel like UIP. And so we would call this alternative diagnostic category. And this patient indeed had hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Okay, so another thing, another disease which, or imaging pattern which is a major player in the alternative diagnostic category is NSIP, so nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. And so in, when you have an alternative diagnostic category, the, the major players, the major alternatives to UIP really are this, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which I just touched on. So what does NSIP look like on HRCT? almost always based or predominant. You, you very often will have ground glass opacity and very often have florid traction bronchiectasis. One of the most specific findings of NSIP on HRCT is that of actually subpleural sparing. So you'll see on the CT on the left that most of the disease, most of the pulmonary opacity is in the central parabronchovascular portions of the lungs. And the most subpleural portion of the lungs are actually spared. If, if not relatively, almost completely in some other areas. So that subpleural sparing is very specific for NSIP. And most of these patients, or at least a, a large proportion of these patients will have connective tissue disease. Other things that can cause it include drugs and medications, as well as hypersensitivity pneumonitis, believe it or not. Here is a NSIP pattern on the coronal reformation. Again, almost always basal predominant. We have areas of ground glass opacity, with some superimposed reticulation and traction bronchiectasis. And even on this case, this image here on the coronal reformation, we see, the, we see that in the left lung, it looks like there is at least some relative subpleural sparing. Again, pretty specific for NSIP as opposed to UIP. So let's back it out a little bit and talk about connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease, just more in general. As I alluded to before, one of the most common patterns of, of interstitial lung disease in patients with connective tissue disease that we see is NSIP. And again, we have another example here on the left. We have a patient with some ground glass opacity and mild reticulation. Again, very common to see ground glass opacity in the setting of NSIP. But you can also get UIP in patients with CTD, ILD, connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease. As Dr. Nathan alluded to before, the UIP pattern really is a pattern. It's an imaging and histological pattern. It is in, of its, in and of itself is not a diagnosis. Um, UIP very often will be associated with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but certainly can be seen in patients with connective tissue disease as well. Now, if you have a known connective tissue disease, there are very common patterns on imaging which arise and also on histology. And so these are the, the common different types of connected tissue disease, which present with interstitial lung disease and other manifestations within the thorax that we see on imaging. And so if you have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis here, if they have pulmonary fibrosis, more common than NSIP, you're going to actually get UIP. Very often, we also see patients with rheumatoid arthritis develop some airways related to disease as well, whether it's bronchiectasis or obliterative bronchiolitis, which, which presents as air trapping on imaging. In patients with systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, if they do develop interstitial lung disease, most of the time it's going to be nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, as I showed you at least a couple of examples before, but they can also get a UIP pattern from time to time. Now, if you have a patient with myositis, including polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and their cousin, the, the antisynthetase syndrome, classic imaging appearance is this sort of combined pattern of organized pneumonia and nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis which is most concentrated at the lung base. And if you have a patient with Sjogren's syndrome, 
when they do develop lung disease, it's not actually as common for them to develop UIP or NSIP. What we're actually looking for is more often than not a cystic lung disease, which manifests as a lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis pattern. Now let's talk about hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this is again, one of the big three interstitial lung diseases that we're gonna encounter on HRCT. And when you have an alternative diagnostic category, it's one of the big two in addition to NSIP. So if you read the textbooks on fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a big deal is made about upper or mid lung preponderance disease. But I'll tell you, in the majority of cases, some, some studies say just a, a, a slight majority. Other studies are a little bit more definitive in the, in the, uh, in the number of patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis having this pattern. Um, they actually have lower lung preponderance disease, right? So someone has asked me, well, what, why do we make this deal, big deal about upper or mid lung preponderance disease in hypersensitivity pneumonitis? It's because we know that both UIP and NSIP, so the, the two other big threes, uh, they usually have basilar predominant fibrosis. So if you have a patient with upper lung preponderant fibrosis, then it draws you away from a diagnosis of UIP and NSIP more toward this hypersensitivity pneumonitis diagnosis. Other clues to the diagnosis also include central lobular nodules, specifically if they're ground glass and sort of had this smudgy appearance to them. I'll show you an example of that in one second. And superimposed mosaic attenuation or air trapping, which I've already shown you an example. So here's a patient who has some diffuse ground glass opacity in the lungs. But if you look very carefully, there's actually a central lobular prominence in these, these nodules, this ground glass opacity. And so that actually is your first indication this patient has hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But on top of that, the patient also has central and upper lung preponderant pulmonary fibrosis, characterized by some reticulation and architectural distortion. Here's a coronal MINIP reconstruction, which brings out the ground glass central lobular nodularity, as well as highlights some of the traction bronchiexis within the upper aspect of the lungs related to the patient's fibrosis. This is a pretty typical appearance of a patient with chronic fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another example here of patient with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. On the left, we have our inspiratory image. On the right, we have our expiratory image. And so we clearly have findings of pulmonary fibrosis, reticulation, architectural distortion, some traction bronchiexis. Also in the axial plane on the inspiratory image, the distribution looks pretty diffuse. And that is another finding that we look for in patients with suspected chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But on top of it, we also have mosaic attenuation. So on the inspiratory image, we see these polygons, these, these, these localized areas of lower density, which on expiration retain their low density rather than getting more gray. So you know these areas of mosaic attenuation are areas of air trapping. And so when you have significant pulmonary fibrosis, regardless of the distribution with air trapping, and we're not talking one or two lobules of air trapping, significant air trapping. Then you start thinking about chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you obviously would put that, that imaging pattern in the alternative diagnostic category, and certainly it draws you away from a diagnosis of UIP. I'll just touch base on this very, very briefly. I wanted to bring to your attention that in addition to the multi-society ATS guidelines for UIP classification on CT, there's also a Fleischner guidelines. And so again, taking some liberties here, the nice thing about the Fleischner and the multi-society guidelines or that they are nearly exactly the same. The only difference is in nomenclature. So for example, instead of just calling it UIP, it's called typical UIP, but probable UIP is still probable UIP, indeterminate UIP is still indeterminate UIP. But instead of calling it alternative diagnosis, like the multi-society guidelines does, the Fleischner guidelines calls a non-IPS pattern. But more or less, again, taking a couple liberties here and there, this pattern, this classification system is almost exactly the same as the multi-society guidelines. But just be aware, that it's out there. Um, and obviously the best thing to do is to choose one and just go with that. And probably the best thing to do is just decide what you're gonna do with your radiologist and your clinicians at your specific medical center and use that classification system going forward. All right, so let's talk about the role of HRCT in monitoring disease progression in IPF. So, in a nutshell, and I could, you know, this is a little bit of a busy slide. There's a lot of text there. I think the easiest way to summarize everything that's here, all the data that's presented here, is that really at this point, there's no consensus on how we should use HRCT to monitor patients. I've worked at some centers where 
they actually um, will image patients whenever they come in. So the patients come in every six months, we'll get an HRC for every six months, uh, as, long as, as long as there are no other um, reasons not to. At other centers, like the center I work in now, University of Chicago, we really don't follow patients with HRCT. Certainly we'll use HRCT to diagnose patients. And if the patient has some sort of untoward event, we might use HRCT or CTA to evaluate any sort of complications related to interstitial lung disease. But we don't specifically use it to follow patients. Usually we will use PFTs to follow those patients. So last year, Ari Fisher published a review article on systemic sclerosis interstitial lung disease. And in that paper, he talks about his suggested frequency of HRCT in patients who have systemic sclerosis interstitial lung disease or suspected disease. And so this is just his opinion, his center's uh, approach to how to follow these patients with HRCT. And as you see from this table, they start to image these patients at 12 months and in certain situations will be as aggressive as six to 12 months. But it's important to understand that at this point, there are no guidelines that we should definitively follow patients with interstitial lung disease or systemic sclerosis with HRCT. Again, very heterogeneous in how we use HRCT to follow these patients. So now we have some audience questions that we could go through. If UIP, NSIP, and chronic HP can have common features, very true, how can something accurately be said to be UIP? if it's possible to have ground glass opacity or other non-UIP features? Well, I, I will, I, I'll just say that it's true. There are cases, specific cases, where you can have CT patterns of UIP, NSIP, and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which look nearly identical. So those are hard cases. And so uh, that's why we actually follow these patients um, and try to diagnose these patients, not in isolation in radiology, but as a multidisciplinary team with pulmonary, rheum rheumatology, radiology, and pathology coming together to try to find the best diagnosis for that specific patient, as well as um, also coming together to figure out what the best next steps are for that patient. And so uh, that, that being said, I will say that that first category that I talked about, the UIP pattern on HRCT, if you have that in your hand, on your, your workstation, your PAX machine, uh, peripheral basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis with subpleural honeycombing and no other findings that suggest an alternative diagnosis, you're done. It's going to be UIP and it's going to be accurate greater than 95% of the time. And that situation, um, assuming that you've excluded known cause for interstitial lung disease, you've essentially made the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So it's not that in all situations, HRCT is going to have sort of um, limited specificity. There are specific situations, for example, with that UIP pattern where HRCT can be highly specific and highly accurate, but in, not in all cases. Next question is here. If imaging shows air trapping, and I assume you mean significant air trapping, is it definitive HP? No, it's not. It, it's just more likely to be HP than say UIP and IPF. It certainly draws you away from a diagnosis of UIP but we still need to do multidisciplinary discussion. We still need to have that patient have a history and physical. Uh, in certain situations, we, we still may need to do surgical lung biopsy and, and get pathology. But in and of itself, again, imaging in many situations or the majority of situations is not gonna be entirely diagnostic without some clinical support. Uh, and then the, the last question here that, that I would like to answer uh, given time constraints is this. Differentiating true honeycombing from traction bronchiectasis, extending to the pleural. Um, that can be hard, that can be hard. Um, what a lot of people who do uh, imaging in the setting of pulmonary fibrosis interstitial lung disease believe that honeycombing on CT actually emanates from bronchi bronchiectasis or traction bronchiectasis. And there is some data to support that. So they might be in and of the same thing. So perhaps differentiating the two isn't that important. I will say that I was taught, and I think many centers are, are teaching their residents and fellows this, if you have patients with pulmonary fibrosis and have two cysts or three cysts, depends where you are, two or three cysts touching each other within the most subpleural portion of the lung in the setting of fibrosis, you have to have surrounding areas of reticulation, you just call it honeycombing, you move on. Um, whether that actually emanated from some traction bronchiex or bronchiolexis, it can be difficult to say. But again, pathophysiologically, it seems like that's where the data is pushing us, that's probably 
just emanated from traction bronchiexis or bronchiolexis. So why split hairs in this set? Okay, so now let's talk about the importance of multidisciplinary discussion in reaching an accurate diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. And I'll be doing this uh, in collaboration with Dr. Nathan. So interstitial lung disease really requires a team approach. And so I talked about this, Dr. Nathan talked about this. And so you need to get all these people all in one room. So radiology, pulmonary, pathology, rheumatology, all together, get your data, try to figure out what the best diagnosis for that patient and reach a consensus diagnosis. Okay, I know it can be difficult to do that nowadays given how busy people are. And so I know sometimes people will actually do sort of like a, a pseudo multidisciplinary discussion either through HIPAA compliant email or texting. And I don't think that's wrong. I think you can do that. Remember these patients with interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, they have a chronic lung disease. So a delay of diagnosis of a few days or even up to a couple of weeks probably is not gonna change the patient's outcomes. And so if that's the best way you can do it from a practical standpoint, go ahead, right? You gotta do what, what you can given the time constraints that you have. But I will say that personally, I think that you probably get the best diagnosis and probably have the best collaboration if you get everyone in one room at the same time. Jonathan, can I chime in there? Of course. And, and, and keep it uh, more contemporary. I wouldn't say get everyone in the same room. I changed the R to a Z, get everyone in the same Zoom. Zoom, yes, of course. That's right, that's right. For sure, for sure. Given the, given the current times, I agree with you. So uh, there's, there's a lot of data here, but this, is, this slide really is just to remind us, to, to, to remind you guys, the audience, that a single component is not the gold standard in diagnosis in interstitial lung disease. Truly the gold standard means of diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is multidisciplinary discussion. It's not pathology, it's not radiology, um, it's, it's not even a detailed history and physical by, by someone as skilled as Dr. Nathan. It's everyone coming together, getting their data, and again, trying to achieve what the best diagnosis is for that patient. Um, this, again, this also holds for pathology. This holds for pathology. And so um, there, there are some data that suggests that a pathologist will change his or her diagnosis maybe one out of five times, about 20% of the time, based on multidisciplinary discussion. And so that's actually pretty jarring because in any other field that I know of, pathology is the gold standard, right? We, what do we say? We say tissue is the issue. Uh, but in ILD, it is not because when we do surgical lung biopsy to get pathology, we get a very, very small bit of tissue. While on CT, HRCT, we get the whole lung image. So there is a discordance there. So a pathologist, they have their, their you know, high, high powered microscopes where they can see very, very fine detail, but they're not seeing the whole picture. And that's where imaging sort of is synergistic with pathology. And obviously we're all synergistic today together in the multidisciplinary setting. Dr. Nathan, did you have anything to add in that regard? No, I agree with you totally. Excellent. Okay, and so just to underline that fact, just to kind of like really point out the importance and the value of multidisciplinary discussion, as opposed to just being in isolation, being an island in and of yourself, either as a clinician or as a radiologist. There's this paper that was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2016, which shows that if you use multidisciplinary discussion, you actually get um, more powerful prognostic information in, in differentiating patients with IPF versus non-IPF than if you use data specifically just from a clinician or just from radiology. So um, this, it's, again, it's hard to do these studies that, 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 that definitively demonstrate that multidisciplinary discussion is more accurate than say pathology or radiology or, or clinical history and physical, but there is a lot of data that sort of like walks around this and certainly strongly implies that multidisciplinary discussion is far superior to any single data point in the setting of interstitial lung disease. Okay, and that brings us to the practicum. Um, I'm actually going to hand the reins here to Dr. Nathan because most of this uh, is actually clinical on the on the front end of things. All right, um, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we have a, a nice, I think, instructive case. And I'm going to ask for I'm going to call a friend during the case. I'm going to call you, Jonathan, when we get to the radiographs. So the patient is a 64 year old uh, gentleman with interstitial lung disease discovered due to a workup for cough. 
the time of his initial presentation, he didn't have any symptoms of uh, shortness of breath, no limitations, no significant exposures, no real prior medical history of note, and his reveal systems was also benign. Specifically, there was no evidence either on, uh, on history or physical of any kind of connective tissue disorder. His lung function when he initially presented is shown here. So his um, FVC was uh, mildly reduced at 68%. Uh, his TLC were actually more in the moderate range around 64%. And the DL was about in the same ballpark at 59% and no obstructive disease. He, all, his, all of his serologies were negative. He had a good walk distance and he didn't desaturate significantly. Um, at that time, um, he also had a heart catheterization um, uh, in, in, in terms of his workup, but I think the thought was, um, you know, maybe he'll progress and he might need a transplant. He had normal coronaries and normal pulmonary artery pressures. This is his CT, Jonathan. I don't know how well it's showing for you, but do you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, so we, we see these uh, sequential axial images from superior to inferior. And clearly there are areas of subpleural reticulation, which probably is basal predominant. You know, it's, it's hard to know if there's actually subpleural honeycombing or not. Um, and, th and this is like a real life case. These are these real life cases where I'm kind of hemming and hawing, is there a honeycombing or not? Uh, obviously when it's floored honeycombing, it's easy to call. But in situations like this, I'm kind of in between. I think I would probably call this a probable UIP pattern, um, but maybe I'd call it UIP if, uh, depending on how many cups of coffee I drank that day. Uh, but for now, I think I would call this probable UIP. Okay, thank you. And let's, uh, let's move on. It's interesting because this uh, case started out before the most recent guidelines. So I don't, I don't recall exactly how he was called. Actually, we have some further cuts. Maybe this will make it easier. This is from the same CT. Does this change your opinion one way or the other? Mm. No, I mean, this definitely shows that clearly it is basal predominant. But yeah, I, I, there might be some honeycomb there, but I'm not confident. I probably still would stick with a probable UIP pattern. Is that your final answer, Dr. Chung? It is my final answer. <laughs> okay, good enough. I agree. So here we have clear evidence of some form of interstitial lung disease in a 64-year-old patient, nothing else going on, no exposure, CTD, workup uh, negative. Um, so one of the first questions we had at that time was whether or not to biopsy this patient. And um, Jonathan, I, I don't know what your feeling is or was, um, but I'll tell you what we did do or what we didn't do. Uh, we felt 64-year-old gentleman, nothing else going on, uh, probable UIP pattern, and we felt like this was sufficient to make a diagnosis of IPF without a, a lung biopsy of any sort. I think that's more than reasonable. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like high pretest probability of IPF even before the HRCT, and the HRCT shows a pro like at, at best a probable UIP pattern, maybe a UIP pattern, and so uh, even with a probable UIP pattern with a high pretest probability of IPF, I think most most centers. Um, don't biopsy those patients anymore. Presumptive diagnosis of IPF is made. Yeah, and so that's exactly what we did. Uh, he, uh, this was a number of years ago, so he participated in a clinical study of antifibrotic therapy, and he stayed stable for many years after that. Um, five years after his diagnosis, he developed some increasing shortness of breath, and you can see his serial PFTs, his FEC decreased from 3.3 liters down to 2.58. Um, and his FPV1 went down similarly, loss of about um, uh, at least 700 cc's, and his DL went down as well. So clear symptomatic and objective evidence of progression over five years. Around this time, he noticed the onset of significant joint aches and pains. He had a rheumatology consult. They sent off a whole panel. His rheumatoid factor came back very positive, as did his anti-CCP, and he was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And this was his CT around the same time. Jonathan, let me make sure there are no additional images before you take a crack at this. And we do have additional images. So um, you can control it as well if you like. Uh, why don't you talk us through this? Well, so unfortunately the pulmonary fibrosis has clearly increased compared to the baseline study. And so now there are obvious areas of traction, bronchiexis, obvious areas of subpleural honeycombing as well. And so uh, some examples of subpleural honeycombing include in the left upper lobe, left lower lobe. Yeah, some more in the left lower lobe. 
and um, some of the lingula as well. And so, uh, and again, this just points to the fact that it is basal predominant, the, the, uh, the more inferior cuts here. And so what do we have? We have progression of something that was either probably UIP or UIP into something that's clearly UIP at this point. And uh, so the big question uh, uh, comes up, um, you know, was this, um, was this IPF to start and then he just happened to develop rheumatoid arthritis or was this rheumatoid arthritis with the ILD as the initial manifestation? And so I, I don't pretend to have an answer, but he has, and we can discuss it at the end. He has listed, because he has significantly limited at this time, he has listed for a lung transplant and he ended up requiring up to six liters with activity. His lung allocation score was not that high, around 39, but he got a single lung transplant about two months after listing. And we did a single lung, he was more elderly and um, he did uh, pretty well with this. So in terms of the question, was this IPF followed by the development of RA or was this RA with ILD as a first manifestation? And this becomes a somewhat philosophical question, but it, it's always coarse to go back and say, well, maybe we should have um, biopsied him and would it have changed the management? Would we have seen evidence of uh, rheumatologic changes like lymphoid aggregates or pleuritis or something else to suggest a rheumatologic condition? And I'm not sure it would have made a difference. Um, as I mentioned around this time, we didn't have antifibrotic therapy. And um, you know, if we'd seen evidence of rheumatoid arthritis with a lot of inflammation, which based on the CT seems somewhat doubtful, maybe we, we would have treated him with immunosuppressive therapy. Although being that it was a UIP pattern or evolving UIP pattern, I cannot be optimistic he would have responded to that. So by virtue of the fact that he had a lung transplant, we've got a whole lot of tissue to give our pathologists to play with. And uh, pathologists are interesting. You can never give them too much tissue. When we gave him the one lung, he said, but where's the other lung? Uh, that's a joke. Um, anyway, so what, what did we see on the lung biopsy? Uh, there was evidence of uh, fibroblastic foci shown here with the red arrows. So something we would see typically with URP evidence of honeycombing and other features seen with a URP pattern and certainly something we would have suspected based on the CAT scan. Uh, there's also some evidence of vasculitis with inflammation, looks like some endothelial inflammation and surrounding lymphocytic infiltration around this vessel. And also some areas of dense inflammation, a lot of lymphocytes in uh, different parts of the lung. Uh, as well as chronic pleuritis, which we is usually regarded pathologically as, a, as evidence of an underlying CTD. IPF by itself doesn't usually give you a pleuritis. Uh, so the question remained was, uh, it certainly looked like rheumatologic changes with evidence of a URP pattern, which is the most common pattern in rheumatoid arthritis. But it's also conceivable that he started out as IPF and then developed rheumatoid arthritis, and then the rheumatologic changes happened after the fact. So it becomes a little bit of a philosophical discussion. I don't think it really made a difference in terms of his management. And thankfully, he had a, a very good outcome after having the single lung transplant. But this does raise the important point that the appropriate diagnosis may evolve over time. It's a dynamic process in terms of giving patients a diagnosis. RA, URP, and pulmonary manifestations of other occult connective tissue disorders may certainly mimic IPF. And of cases with diagnosed IPF, about 10% of them over time will evolve to some kind of connective tissue disease. So in summary, interstitial lung diseases are complex heterogeneous diseases that are difficult to diagnose sometimes. They require the early recognition of signs and symptoms and HRCT to confirm the diagnosis in many cases, but also to point one in the right direction in cases where the HRCT is uh, uncertain. Uh, communication amongst multidisciplinary team members is essential to an accurate diagnosis, and hopefully that point came home uh, nice and clear. Antifibrotic therapy may help preserve lung function, and the earlier one can start this, the better. We're seeing a lot of emerging data from registries around the world attesting to the fact that those patients placed on antifibrotic therapy are indeed living longer. So we have some questions, and let's go through them. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to help me to tackle these. Let's go through the first one. Should uh, these dedicated HRCT studies be interpreted only by chest radiologists or at least those dedicated to the field? That's one, that's one is for you, Jonathan. I, I, I think that anyone really can interpret these HRCTs for the purposes of 
interstitial lung disease diagnosis. So, so all it requires is someone to want to learn and someone to want to do a good job, right? So if you do have those two attributes, uh, then it's pretty easy to learn how to diagnose these. Um, I will say that if you, at your medical center, if you do have dedicated chest radiologists, they probably are gonna be the ones that have the most um, training in regard to HRCT diagnosis, but not all of them. So not, not all, all chest radiologists are interested in interstitial lung disease. So probably the best thing to do is at your local center, from a practical standpoint, find the person who has the most interest in HRCT and interstitial lung disease diagnosis and work with that person so that person can be like your go-to whenever you have a case of patient with pulmonary fibrosis or suspected pulmonary fibrosis. Thank you. That um, kind of leads into the next question. What is the role of interventional radiology in the diagnosis and treatment of ILD? Um, I'm not sure they have any role in the diagnosis unless they, they've all had radiology training. And if you don't have a thoracic radiologist and they're comfortable reading the CT, maybe they can help there. And with regards to treatment, I'm not aware of any IR treatments for ILD. Jonathan, do you want to chime in with any insight into that? I have nothing to add, no. There's, yeah, I, I don't know of any role for interventional radiology at this point. Okay, sounds good. Subpleural scarring with honeycombing or traction bronchiectasis diagnosis would be? Well, I mean, good. yeah, I mean, that, yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to, just based on that, to say what the diagnosis is, is going to be. You, we should just stick to the, the either the multi-sided ATS guideline classification for UIP, or we should stick to Fleischner. So um, just based on one or two findings, you can't really say what the pattern is. And it's really the constellation of findings and distribution. And it's also the clinical. You have to put it in the context of the clinical. That The diagnosis might be IPF in an 80-year-old male. Yep. but it could well be consistent with a CTD in a 40-year-old female. So it's hard to look at that just in isolation, which underscores the value, once again, of multidisciplinary discussions. All right, this is a good one. Is repeat imaging ever chosen instead of doing a biopsy? Well, um, you know, repeat imaging can be helpful because the disease can evolve over time. I think we saw it quite nicely in that case where it was questionable UIP pattern initially and then clearly evolved to a UIP pattern. I think if it comes to the question of should the patient get a lung biopsy or not, I think you have to weigh two things. Um, does a patient, is the patient agreeable? Are they a good candidate? Do they have multiple comorbidities that's gonna put them at risk of a lung biopsy? So once again, this is a decision um, you know, that has many moving parts in terms of making the, uh, the right decision. There are some cases, and Jonathan, you probably see these, of the so-called early interstitial lung abnormalities where there's stuff there, you're not sure what it is, maybe not enough to go after with a biopsy where a repeat CT in six months or a year might not be unreasonable. Jonathan, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, think, I think, again, it's, it's hard to come down hard um, and answer this question definitively. But in that specific subset of these, some people call them ILA, interstitial lung abnormalities. So just very mild something that could be very early fibrosis. It makes sense to do perhaps an annual CT to make sure that that isn't getting worse. Some places perhaps would just do PFTs to follow those patients. But certainly I, in, especially with these lung cancer screening CTs, I will bring that to their attention and say, this patient has ILA, some mild interstitial lung abnormality and special attention should be made to reevaluate these areas on follow-up imaging. All right, it looks like we've come to the end of the questions and the end of the program. So I'd like to thank everyone for hanging with us doing this program. Jonathan, anything to add on your end? No, nope, this pleasure is all mine. Always a, a joy working with you. Likewise, thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.